Um, so as many of you know, I'm Casey Wolfington. I'm a licensed psychologist and the Community Behavioral Health Director with Eagle Valley Behavioral Health. Um, a few quick housekeeping items, just so you know, this presentation will be recorded. And um, I think it's really important as this message shows above, we're gonna be discussing avalanche trauma. We're gonna be talking about death and loss and grief. And it's something that's a, had a real impact in our mountain community, especially in the past few months, the past few weeks. Um, and because this presentation will be recorded, just know that if something is hard to process or you feel yourself getting overwhelmed, feel free to walk away. You know, I encourage you to walk away and to come back to this at a different time. I think it's really important when we're processing grief, when we're processing trauma, that we don't force it upon ourselves. And so just make sure that you take the time that you need and be compassionate with yourself. And also, if you need additional support, don't hesitate to reach out to the Hope Center. Um, they can be reached at 970-306-4673. And although they focus on crisis services, you don't have to be in crisis to use their services or to gauge their support. So just know that that process and that support piece is open for you. And also know that this presentation is the beginning of a conversation on this topic with our community. We're not gonna get through everything um, that we hope to discuss this time. And we're gonna be able to build on some of the concepts that we start to introduce here. So just know that we really envision this as being the beginning of a conversation that we're gonna have and hopefully continue to have. So we would love your feedback on this presentation and how we can work to best shape this conversation to meet your needs. Um, a few quick housekeeping items. You guys are all very familiar with Zoom and virtual platforms now. We do have everyone on mute and we hope that you stay on mute during the presentation. But do, do not let that hesitate or have, make you hesitant from asking questions or engaging in comments. Please use the Q&A function or the chat function to communicate with us. We'll do our best to monitor that. We have a number of our team members that are present that can monitor that. And we'll be able to engage those conversations in real time. So um, we won't just save the, um, the questions if they're relevant um, to the end unless you know it's specifically done designated to save to the end. And again, um, you know, make sure that you're taking care of yourself. So I'd love to introduce our lead speaker, Jennifer Feinberg. Jenny is a licensed professional counselor living in Durango. As a backcountry snowboarder, she understands the why of living in the mountains in a mountain community. And wilderness plays an important life um, role in her life and personal growth as well as self-care. Before becoming a counselor, Jenny worked as an outdoor instructor for a number of organizations, including the National Outdoor Leadership School. She recognized the impact of being in wild places and the impact that this had on individual and group development. In 2006, she and her husband moved to Montana to pursue graduate degrees. She went to Montana State University and got her master's in mental health counseling and became licensed in 2014. Her outdoor lifestyle tended to attract clients that engaged in similar activities, including skiing. Over the years, she worked with a number of folks involved in avalanches and became a counselor who specialized in this practice with survivors. Jenny primarily works in internal family systems and polyvagal theories, and they're both excellent models to work with this type of trauma. And I know those will be part of her presentation today and exp um, exploring those concepts with you guys. When not working, she and her husband Mike and dog Emma are outside like many of you. They're either playing in the river, playing in the snow, or anything in between. Jenny and her husband are connected deeply through a sense of inner adventure. And in 2018, she and Mike and Emma, for part of the way, completed a source to see river expedition on the Green and Colorado Rivers, starting in the Wind River Range in Wyoming, and they navigated to a source of the Green River and pack rafted until they could put their, their dory, uh, the Green River, on the water. 
They floated for five months until the river ran dry on the border of US and Mexico. So you'll be seeing some of these photos of this trip, trip during this presentation. And Jenny will be discussing some of those emotions that came up during this journey. And we're hoping that um, Jenny's journey and her expertise in this area can help our community. And at the end, we'll talk about um, resources that probably you guys have heard me talk about numerous times and how to engage uh, treatment. But we're so excited to have Jenny with us in our community. So Jenny, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Casey. And um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. <laughs> Feels weird to hear about yourself. Um, so I, I don't feel the need to introduce any more about myself other than to say, you know, I'm not an original researcher. You know, I am a voracious studier and, you know, I read a lot about theories and, and practice on my clients. And so, so what I'm talking about today is just a collaboration of um, just a lot of things that I've practiced. And, and also don't take my word as like the word of God. Like Casey is so... Um, is so knowledgeable and works a lot with trauma. So Casey, like we're in this together. So jump in anytime, please. Thank you so much. Awesome. We'll do. Okay. Um, all right. So let's try this out here. Um, let me, now I'm trying to figure out how to, <laughs> there it goes. Okay. So the presentation today, um, like Casey said, there's a lot of information here and the reality is we're probably not going to get through all of it. And Casey, I love the, the metaphor that you used. Um, learning about trauma is like, imagine filling a glass of water. And if you, if the water flows over the glass, you're not going to be able to take any in. So we're going to try to keep this as simple as we can. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to jump in and ask, type in the chat. I, Casey and Casey are going to be looking out for that. So we want to, this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so, so the flow of today, uh, we're gonna be looking at like why we're here and what these mountains do for us internally, why we make these choices to go out. And then I also think it's really important to talk about emotions. We live in a culture that is so heady that we, and so black and white, we're like emotions are either good or bad. And we don't really, take in the wisdom of what these emotions are trying to tell us. So we're gonna talk about, about emotions. Um, and also what I see with trauma survivors, specifically avalanche trauma survivors, and, and then also talk about what trauma is. Um, and that you don't have to be a combat veteran to experience PTSD, that many of us do actually experience it. And then if we get time, we'll talk about um, how you can help and then other resources as well. So we'll see how far we get today. So let's start with why we're here. Um, so there's the old phrase, the, you know, the mountains are calling. And, you know, you think about what, what space does for us. You know, we all you know, we like to go out for hikes, we like to go snowboarding, we like to go swimming in mountain lakes. Um, and these, you know, the mountains, uh, whether it's mountains or the desert or rivers or however you like to get outside here, they offer freedom, they offer exploration, and they offer a sense of community. Like you think about going out on an expedition with somebody and you think, or, or a group of people, and you think about the bonding that happens in that, in that experience. And so you think about these mountain communities and the bonding that you experience with some of these folks in the community, you walk down to the local brewery and it's like, oh yeah, we went on that backcountry ski trip together. Oh, we did that river trip together. And so the mountains are here are a source of connection to us, connection to self, connection to others and connection to community. And so you guys have an amazing community in Vail. Um, in Eagle County and you guys have really rallied. Um, I'm just hearing from my own personal experiences, you guys have really rallied around celebrating life and also the trauma that you guys have gone through with a lot of these deaths. So, so you guys feel, it's obvious that you feel that community bond. 
So that's why we're here. Um, but I wanna just take a moment and let you feel something. And so um, imagine having a goal. So whether that's hiking a peak, whether that's learning how to snowboard, either on area or off area, or playing a musical instrument, or even learning how to play chess, but thinking about something that you, you strove you how to do. And then imagine engaging in that activity when you've learned it. Either you've gotten to the top of that peak, or right here you're on that snowboard, snowboarding in deep powder, or you're really lost in the moment of playing that musical instrument, or you're crushing that chess game. So just imagine what it feels like to be in that state. And, and if you're able to do that, that is all flow state. And I'm not gonna even try to pronounce this guy's name, um, but uh, he's Polish or he's, he's somewhere out in Eastern Europe. But the best moments of our lives are not in the passive, receptive, or relaxing times. The best moments are usually engaging our body or, or, or our mind, and it's stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult or worthwhile. And so I know for me, like when I imagine snowboarding in deep powder, I'm not thinking, like I'm, I'm engaging, I'm doing. My mind and my body are integrated and it's, I'm in that flow. And, you know, um, it's, I mean, it's a beautiful feeling. And I think that's why many of us choose to go out and snowboard or ski or um, whatever we do out here in the mountains is to achieve that flow state. We're not just sitting on our phones letting life go by, we're, we're actually engaging. And so I, I, you guys can read, so I'm not gonna go through all the, the bullet points of the flow state, but I think it's really important to know that flow state is a healthy thing. Um, it allows us to connect to ourselves and it allows us to increase our confidence. And, and so you think about um, like the qualities that come out of accomplishing a flow state or accomplishing something. And, and it's calmness, curiosity, compassion, um, connectedness, creativity, clarity. Um, and so, so we'll talk a little bit more about why we experience these and what they mean. Um, but so I call, this, I call these qualities in, in, in IFS, internal family systems, we call this being self-led that we're able to connect, we're able to engage. Um, and, um, and, and I think holding compassion and curiosity in, the, in these places um, are, are super, super important. So we'll get more and talk, we'll talk about this a bit more later. But any, should I stop here for any questions or comments so far? So far, none. But thank you, I love this. I think a lot of people are gonna connect with this flow state and the examples you just Great. So something that uh, I, I get a lot of fear, so I work a lot with avalanche survivors um, and something that, that comes up quite often is whether it's the survivor themselves or the community or the people around them, like, why did you choose to be out there? And so our, our culture, I'm, I'm trying not to diss our culture. <laughs> but, so our culture is very disconnected. Um, and, and I think a lot of our culture doesn't understand the need to be out in nature um, or to be out in these wild places. So, so we think about, being out there is being really risky. And the reality is we get in a car every single day. We drive this car down a road with a yellow line is the only thing that's separating you from the other oncoming car. And we do this every single day. And we don't look at this typically as a risk, but it is, and we still do it. Or I, you know, other risks that I think about that we do every day, um, even like 
the foods that we eat, like choosing to eat these processed foods, we're putting, that's risky to put into our bodies, gambling, um, investing money. And there's a lot of risk that we do in our culture that we don't really talk about as being risky. But then we go, we, those of us who live in these mountain communities choose to go out into the mountains because we understand what flow state means. We understand how to connect to self, how to connect to others, and how to connect to our environment, to, to the landscape that is providing this opportunity for us. And so we're choosing to be out there. And a lot of us, we don't go out there mindlessly. Like you think about to become a backcountry skier or snowboarder, oh, you have to learn a lot about it. You take an Abbey One course or you learn about avalanches. You learn how you get mentorship on how to be out there, how to read the terrain, how to understand what a terrain trap is or digging a snowpack, um, or sorry, digging a pit and understanding what the pack, the snowpack is. And we have a beacon, we have a shovel and a probe. And so we have, we have a, a large level of education in doing these things. I even think about river trips. Um, you know, we take swift water rescue or you learn how to row a boat <laughs> in big rapids. And um, so a lot of education and mentorship goes into getting outside. Even, you know, you think about wilderness first responders and wilderness first aid, we learn how to take care of ourselves out there. And so we make these decisions to go out and I see that as a healthy risk. And if we didn't take these risks, then we wouldn't be growing, we wouldn't be learning, we wouldn't be experiencing and engaging. So where it gets to be unhealthy and whether it's in the back country or in the front country, is if you go mindlessly into an activity. So we go through driver's ed to learn how to drive a car. And so I, well, I mean, I will say that <laughs> I drove golf carts without knowing what to do, but it was kind of dangerous when I was like 14. And so, so we think about the risks that we take in our daily life um, and the mentorship that goes into those risks. And also, if we go into that risk unprepared, that's when it starts to become unhealthy. Or you think about, is this ego led? Do I need to do this without the mentorship, without the education? Um, so I, I could go on all day about this, this healthy risk versus unhealthy risk. Um, but is there anything anybody wants to share or any questions or comments about this? There's one comment. Um, Caroline wanted you to know that this is the most calming thing she's heard and thanks so much for helping her community. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. And Jenny, maybe one thing I'll add in here is also this idea that how interesting in activities, you know, whether it's driving a car, or going in the back country, how risk feels maybe more real or more easily identifiable after something negative happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that it brings up this piece is that human beings aren't great at evaluating risk. And so we're great at having fear in response to an event. But, you know, I think that's something that makes trauma difficult to process because there comes up all these emotions of I should have done this, or if I would have only done X, Y, and Z, which maybe is leave the house later, or send a text to a friend, um, and all of that is just because there's so much risk around us all the time and we can't control it, and that sometimes is hard to process. Absolutely, that's a really, really good point. That, yeah, that, that experiencing that it does drive a lot of fear and a lot of um, recognizing what you don't have control over, right? Yeah. yeah. And and so and we're going to get into this. We're going to talk a lot more about trauma, and I'm so glad you've already brought that up, Casey. Um, and and I'm just going to put a plug in for this too. So we have physical needs. You know, we need to eat food. We need to drink water. We need to be warm and dry when it's snowing and freezing outside. 
So just like we have physical needs, we also have emotional needs. And we're gonna go through what those emotional needs are, but engaging in healthy risk is an emotional need because it does allow us to grow and to change and to evolve. And so I, I was involved in a, um, a boating accident where, I, I won't go into the details of it, um, but it, I recognized um, what I didn't have control over. And, and it gave me an opportunity to grow from that experience. Um, I, could, I could walk away from that experience and say, I'm never boating again. But if I had done that, then I would have missed out on this incredible opportunity that my husband and I went down for five, the river for five months and I wouldn't have grown. And so I had to work with my fear and to recognize I'm not gonna let my fear hold me back from growth. So we'll talk a lot more about that. Anything else, Casey, that you wanna to add to that? No, thank you. So let's go into emotions. Um, and again, I, I, I just, I, if you're, my clients, they hear this all the time that we have to listen to her emotions. And, and again, our culture, I go on rants about our culture all the time, so forgive me. We do have great things about our culture. <laughs> but our emotional um, disconnect and dissociation is really damaging to us. And it, it, it makes traumatic experiences even worse. And so, um, so I, I studied with a Native American psychologist a while ago. Um, his name is Ed Duran. And if you ever have a chance to read any of his books on Native American trauma, um, there he's incredible. But he said something to me that really, it just kind of, it took me back. Because um, I grew up in the South and we talk about if you feel that then something's wrong, unless you're the, the only the only okay feeling is happiness. All the other feelings are bad. And if you're if you're not feeling happy, then you fake it till you make it. Um, so we miss out on all this wisdom that these emotions offer us. And and so Ed was like, okay, so you white people, like you guys, you guys just want to conquer everything. You want to conquer the mountains. You want to conquer skiing. You want to conquer emotions even. And I was like, well, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do, right? And he's like, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. And he's like, we, um, I don't remember what nation he's with. Um, but he talked about, we see emotions as, as spirits. And the spirit comes inside of you with information, with wisdom. And your job is to listen to the wisdom so that then the emotion leaves your body. And what's left behind is the wisdom. And he's like, what happens when you don't listen to the wisdom is the emotion starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it starts to take up your body. And that's when the emotion is not good, but, or, or the experience is not good. It's not the emotion is not good. Um, but the emotion is trying to get big because it's like, listen, listen to what I have to say. And so as soon as you do, then it can leave your body. But our culture, doesn't listen to emotions, we shame emotions, we say we shouldn't have them. And so, so many of us, I mean, we're in the, Casey and I are in the field of mental health and we are, we've got plenty of work ahead of us because we, we're not listening to our emotions. And so we're helping people start to listen to them. So, um, any, so any questions about that or comments about that before we jump into what they do? There was one comment that said, uh, it was a Jennifer as well. She said, the flow state information helps me understand the outdoor slash backcountry mindset. It was hard for me to understand, but that slide really helps. Great, great. And um, thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. I appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, the outdoor mindset, I mean, I, I mean yeah, I, I think we can get so disconnected. I mean, I'm, growing up in the South, we didn't, go out a lot. And so I, it took me a little while to understand why would somebody want to go skin up a mountain and snowboard down? I don't understand. <laughs> so I'm glad it helped. Um, so if you think about, uh, think about your human development and when you're born, you're not coming out of the womb knowing how to talk. And so the only language that you have is your emotion or are your emotions. 
You cry to say something's wrong. I'm, I'm needing something. The baby screams to say, you're not listening to me, you know, or um, I don't have a baby. So, <laughs> so I don't know what they do, but I know that they have a lot of emotions, but that's our language. And so our, so our emotional language, even when we're born, it's, it's the emotion of survival. Because if we didn't let our parents know, if a child didn't let their parents know what they needed through their emotions, they could die. If a parent wasn't tuned into that. And so a baby's education or a baby's communication is, is emotion. And it starts there and it stays with us until we die. So our emotions are our ultimate survival, survival language. And, and so emotions, I love this quote. I don't remember where it came from. I should probably find out. But the emotions, emotions are the fundamental language of the brain. They help us, they help navigate the world around us. So what does that mean? So I think the next, yeah. So the next slide, starting with this slide. So we're just gonna turn your brain off for a second, like turn your cognition off. And just, if, if it feels, some of us are so disconnected from our bodies that it's hard for us to feel. And if that's the case, that's absolutely okay. And if you are able to feel, notice what comes up for you as we look at each picture. I think we've got like four or five pictures to look at. But I'll, so we'll start with the little baby giraffe. And just notice what comes up in your body as you look at that baby. We'll go to the next one. I think that's, yeah, that's the last one. So I'm, I'm ending on this one. Um, this is, a, so this is my husband in total flow state. So he, so, so we go from hard emotions to, I like to end on a positive emotion. So this is just after lava um, on the Grand Canyon and he went, had a really clean line. So he was so in the flow state of accomplishment and feeling proud of himself and safe and, um, so I just, this picture just, it, to me, it exemplifies flow state right there. So as we went through those, those slides, um, I don't know if we have any, if, if, you, if anybody wants to share, um, what did you notice maybe about some of those, like the, the man yelling or the, the dog? What did you notice about that coming up in your body? wants to share well I'll share since everyone's muted you know I think it's interesting yeah. to feel those visceral visceral reactions to different pictures and something that was interesting is actually the first um you know the first picture of your husband where he's looking out on the water you know that was a very calming picture for me Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, because I'm really analytical, I'm thinking like, this could have so many different emotions for him. It's everything that I'm putting from my experience there and with no context. So absolutely. Yeah. And so, and Casey, what you're, you're saying is, is really, really important because each one of us is coming to these photos with our own histories, our own experiences. So so for me, having gone through that rainstorm, I was pissed during that rainstorm. And so when I looked out at him in the rainstorm, I was angry because he was yelling in the middle of that and I was yelling and we were in the middle of a fight. And so when I saw that picture, for me, my emotions were like, you need to be pissed off at him. And so it's interesting for you, you're like, I noticed a sense of calm. I noticed a sense of like in the engaging in the, the, the rain and the calmness 
what it looked like calm on his face, right? <laughs> and so, and so, yeah, yeah. And, and for some of us, like the angry guy, like for me, I get pissed when I see that picture and my emotions are like, he's vi like, he could violate your boundaries. He could try to take over what you're trying to say and dominate you. Other people may be like, oh, that's like my uncle. Cool. <laughs> you know, like I'm used to that. I'm all right with that. Like no big deal. Or the, the German shepherd. Some people may be like, oh, that's a really sweet dog, you know, and others may be like, oh my God, I'm going to die if I, if I experience that dog. And so our emotions, we have our own histories coming into it. But it's cool, like if you start to listen to what your emotions are trying to tell you, um, rather than being like, I shouldn't feel angry when I see that guy. I'm, I'm bad for feeling angry. Or, oh, I should learn how to like tame that dog so it doesn't, it doesn't hurt somebody or it doesn't hurt me but listening to what your emotions have to say. And, and so this next slide talks about what, are, what the wisdom of our emotions are. So, and I mean, this is just one person's perspective. I mean, like, and, and nobody, nobody has, like I said earlier, like nobody has the answer for what emotions are. Like, it, it, because our emotions are coming in with a lot of experience and humans have been around for a really long time. But generally anger, Anger comes up to let you know, hey, something could violate me. Something could violate my, my boundaries. I could get hurt in the situation, emotionally or physically. Or guilt is, is, is the emotion coming up to be like, oh my gosh, like I might have hurt somebody or I might have violated my code of ethics or somebody else's code of ethics. So maybe I don't want to do that. Or sadness is is an emotion that comes up to say, I've lost something. And then fear is, oh my gosh, like how could I get hurt in this situation? And again, these can be emotional or physical because our, and we'll get into the, the, the nervous system, um, but our nervous systems are wired to keep you safe from emotionally and physically. So we'll get more into that. And so, so rather than looking at emotions as a bad thing, um, looking at them as what, what do they have to tell me? And if you don't listen to them, that's when they start to get bigger and bigger and bigger to where you're leading your life from the emotional perspective or from that emotion, I call it a part, rather than being self-led like you are when you're in flow state or in self-leadership. So our goal is to lead from self and not to lead from parts. So this is a lot of information to take in. Um, and I just, maybe I'll just pause for questions if there are any. We're good. We're good. Cool. Okay. No questions, Jennifer, just a couple comments. But... Okay. So, there are, I want to highlight a couple emotions that I, I really see with folks that go through, um, well, specifically avalanches, um, or I mean, any kind of trauma where they've experienced loss. And so we, we've got grieving, and we also have survivor guilt and shame. So these are two of the really big ones. Um, and again, if you notice yourself getting activated in this, like, just please take care of yourself. So um, I'm, I won't get too counselory <laughs> here, but a lot of times people come in to my office and they're like, I am depressed. And, and I start to get really curious about that because I, I kind of see anxiety and depression as a state of being. And a lot of times I see sadness as being more about grieving than about depression. And so, so grieving is, is a natural and normal reaction to loss. And loss could be a loss of experience. Like you lost your iPhone, you might start crying and that's okay. You're grieving the loss of that connection to the world around you. Or you get, you grieve missed opportunities. You grieve the loss, death of somebody. And so 
we can't avoid grief. If we avoid grief, that sadness is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger inside of us. So grief is something we have to move into, not away from. And so, so I, I love just being able to sit with people in their grief and to say, let's just stay here and be with your grief because we have to process it. And so we experience a lot of loss. Like when, if you go through an avalanche or even, you know, I, I think about your community, you guys lost, you've lost a lot of people and a lot of really important people to the community. So your, your community is experiencing community grieving. And it's really important to be together in this process and to go through it together. So I lived in Bozeman for the last 15 years We've had a lot of avalanche deaths up in Bozeman. And every time that we lost somebody, it, there's this massive community depression. I mean, it's, it's like this, this, it, the community just dropped and you could just feel the heaviness of that loss. And the community rallied together, much like your community, um, to really be with each other. And so, there's all these things about like the steps of grieving, like you got to go through, you know, the first step of grieving is, you know, sadness, and then you go to anger and denial and all these other things. But I, I think that everyone experiences grieving in their own way. And um, I also think that it's really important to find celebration in, and honoring grieving together. And so a lot of cultures in the past, um, a lot of cultures outside of, well, even in the US, you think about, you know, you go to a funeral to, to celebrate somebody's life and to grieve together. And so um, I don't think we do enough in our culture around creating community grieving. Like I think about COVID this last year and how we've been so isolated from each other and we haven't really come together to create grieving um, to celebrate our grieving together. And, and I know it feels kind of weird to use that word celebrate with grief, but, but it's, it's this coming together. Um, so you've been an avalanche, if you, you've lost somebody to an avalanche. If, if you're a part of the community that is sad about this, you are all going through the grieving process together and know that you're not alone in that. And it's important and necessary for you to feel your grief and to not avoid it. And I know there's lots of resources in the community. Um, and I know Casey's gonna talk more about the resources that you all have, or she's probably already told you a lot about it. <laughs> um, but just, I just can't express enough that how important it is to move into your grief and not away from it. Anything you wanna to add to that, Casey? No, well, sort of, I guess I say no, and then I start talking. Um, you know, I think it's interesting, and everyone on here has probably heard me say this, that, you know, it's not a linear process. There's no start and there's no end. And, you know, grief is a part of a chapter in a book that is your story now. And, you know, you actually can't really predict all the different places it's going to pop up in the future and the different pieces it's going to impact. And I think that's important. I also think, you know, when I'm working with the adventure community, sometimes there's this idea that we're challenge oriented, that, you know, I'm going to hike a mountain and that's going to be my challenge and I'm going to accomplish it. And we can't approach grief in that same accomplishment way because there is no start, there's no ending. And it just is. And, you know, it's interesting when you bring up a flow state, I actually love that it's part of a grief process because there's a flow state to grief too. And I just love that. Absolutely. And I love that you brought that up too. And, and something that I, I a metaphor I use, the reason why I have waves here for grief, I tell clients that when you're going through grief, like, um, like you go through an avalanche and you lose your friends and it's like, you've got tidal waves of grief hitting you like 
one moment after the next, like soon after the trauma happens. And then, and then the waves start to kind of like, like settle down a little bit and you're still getting hit by these waves. Like you've got, you know, you're overwhelmed by it. And then it, then it recedes and you're like, okay, I can live my life. I'm fine. Okay. I'm over it. But then a rogue wave totally hits you. And, and so it's, Casey, I love that you said, I mean, it's a process and it will keep going. And I, I think the, the really important thing to know about grief is that it's, it's showing what you lost matters to you. And, you know, the loss of a friend, the loss of a parent, the loss of a child, the loss of your iPhone, like, like the bigger the grief, the more important it is to you. So it's a way to honor that loss, to sit with your grief no matter how many times those tidal waves hit you. Just know you're gonna get hit, it's gonna recede, and then another one will hit you at some point in time. It might be 50 years later still. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Did you wanna add anything else to that, Casey? No, great. Okay. So, um, so the next one I really wanna help identifies survivor guilt. Um, and I mean, this one's tough. Um, this one's like, I, I, I'm not going to minimize how hard it is to go through survivor guilt. And um, I mean, I still get really emotional when I sit with clients and they just are so overwhelmed with that survivor guilt. And so, so we talked earlier about what, what, the feeling of guilt is, is about. And so guilt, um, guilt is slight, it's different than shame. It's like, I look at it like a continuum. Everything's on a continuum. <laughs> and my clients get so sick of me saying that. Um, but you think about guilt and it's feeling, um, like feeling that your behaviors, you did some, like you you did something wrong with your behavior or your behavior impacted somebody else. And Whereas shame is more about, it's like, okay, I did that behavior. That means I am bad. So you're taking the moral meaning that um, I'm fundamentally flawed for my behavior rather than saying I made a mistake and I'm still okay, which is more on the guilt side. Shame is I made a mistake and I am a horrible human being. I am bad. I'm broken. And so, and survivor guilt, I mean, it, you, it can be with car accidents, it can be with, you know, combat. Um, but I mean, I, I, I think nearly everyone that I've worked with who have survived a, an avalanche or have lost a partner in an avalanche, have, a, there's, I see a lot of survivor guilt. And so, so it shows up differently um, with folks. Uh, but it's kind of like this questioning, like, why did I survive and my partner didn't? What did I do that was wrong? Casey, did you want to say something? There's a, a question right along that line. Um, somebody asked, what's the best way to help the individual who is right there and survives? Yeah, okay. That's a, that's a big one. So, um, and let me, let me get some clarification. And whoever wrote that question, like, who in the actual trauma or when you're, when you're talking with somebody who survived and maybe it's after the trauma. It does. And maybe I'll jump in for that. Cause I think our community could benefit from both of those answers of how, how you can support someone who is there and present. And also how can you support someone who's experiencing that, whether or not they were present. Cause I think that's something we see a lot is I think there's a lot of different levels of survivor guilt. Yeah. So we could spend a lot of time on this one. Um, so, um, and I have a slide on this later, later down the, the road, but we'll just talk about it now. So I think what it starts with is you as the individual who's wanting to help. And so thinking about um, how do I feel when somebody is in pain? What, what is it that I want to do? And, and 
I know I'll speak for myself. Like when I first started doing therapy, I came in, it's like, I want to fix people. I want to take them away from their emotion. I want to, like, I, it was a very anxious, like I can't tolerate their pain. So I need them to change. And, and so doing, first of all, asking yourself and, and when I teach, um, I, I do a lot of teaching for outdoor instructors, like how to stay grounded in the face of student hardship or like student traumas um, or emotional outbreaks. How do I feel towards the situation? So, so let's say we've got somebody coming up and they're in so much shame, even like how like I didn't, it should have been me. Like I did the wrong thing. Like I wish it was, I wish it was me and not my, my friend. And so notice how you feel as that person is in that experience. And, and I encourage you to not be with that person from a fix it anxious perspective, to really hold um, curiosity and compassion for that person, as opposed to, I need to take this person away from their pain. Because you're not gonna take that person away from their pain in that moment. So, so first of all, check yourself. From what, what energy am I coming into the situation with? And, and I tell my clients, like, like, my job is to like, be like Winnie the Pooh and Piglet with you. Like, they kind of just sit next to the river with no agenda and no expectation needing the other person to change. And so, so if you see somebody that's in a lot of pain, they're, they're sitting with a lot of survivor guilt, sitting next to them and um, holding compassion, holding heart curiosity, not head curiosity. And to say, like, tell me more about what's going on, you know, like, um, and maybe we'll jump, maybe we'll jump to that slide in a minute. Um, Cause there's a lot of information between point A to point B here. Um, but so, so that what this person is experiencing is um, like, they're looking at the situation that let's we'll st stay with the, the avalanche traumas. Um, I, you know, I could have done something different or my life is, is not good enough. And my, my friend's life was better than mine. You know, they have kids. I don't, they have a good relationship. I don't, I should have been the one that was in, in harm's way rather than them. I wish they could take me away. And so that person is sitting in shame. And so helping them, and I mean, for each individual, it's different. So there's no crystal ball. There's no perfect answer to, to, to help um, or the roadmap, I guess. But to say, you know, just to help be there with them and to say, you know, your behaviors, your choices don't define you. They don't, they don't determine your worth. And so I, I don't know if I'm being clear um, in case you jump in at any point in time if you wanna. No, I really love this idea of trying to avoid a place of fixing it for someone else, you know, if you're sitting with someone. But I think if you're the one experiencing that survivor guilt, I think also recognize how maybe those guilt thoughts and the different emotions you're experiencing are also your way of processing that trauma and trying to fix the unfixable. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can say that you're to blame and it, things would have been different if you were there, it still ultimately leads you to a place of how much you wish things were different yeah. and how much you wish that we weren't sitting with the situation as it is and that as it was and how it will be for the future. So I think there's this idea that we all wish things could be predictable and we think, wish that we could fix pain mm -hmm. and suffering, especially for our community. Yeah. I, I also think that on a day-to-day -day basis, so many things contribute to our emotional state or whether we get to work on time or whether we're in a good mood or whether we have enough time to cook dinner. Like there's all these little teeny factors that lead up to every event in our life. 
And I think in trauma, what I see a lot is things, people try to make things really simple. Is if I would have done this one thing, it would have fixed everything when life is so not that type of math equation, but it's our way of having control. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, well, well said. So, and Jenny, I'll say there's a few comments and some questions. I'm going to let you keep going through and then I'll, I'll bring them in sort of as we get to the slides because I know you have slides on these things coming up. Yeah, I, let me, I want to jump to, um, I want to jump to this one because I think this can also help explain things a little bit more. And, and it talks about what you are exactly talking about, Casey. Um, so this is my own logic placed on a piece of paper. So, um, so I'm going to try to explain it as quickly as I can. And, and I'm going to move the boxes out of my screen so that I can actually see this. Um, so can you guys see my mouse moving? Okay. So if you look at this, this line here, and I look at this as kind of like trauma, trauma experiences. So down here, you know, this, these are heavy traumas and down here is um, healthy anxieties. So um, I'll try to do this in the quickest way possible. <laughs> so we talk about flow state and we have a threshold that we can handle. And when we're in flow state, or I call it ventral or the cool system, which is ventral vagal. So you think about being in flow state or being in self-led, your brain is, is more calm. Like you're, like you're thinking, you can scan your environment and scan for how am I capable? How am I safe? How am I okay in this environment? Um, your, your nervous system is calm. Your, your uh, digestive system, the endocrine system, like all of your systems are working in a healthy way when you're in this cool system. So this is ventral vagal, the highest evolved nervous system state that we're in. This allows for connection which is the biggest, the biggest piece here. It allows us to connect to people, to self, to others, and to our environment. And so, um, and here are more of our emotional needs are being met in our environment, in our physical needs. And so emotional needs, meaning that I feel capable. I, I can achieve some kind of success in this environment. I'm cared for, I belong to a group. I have some kind of power or influence in my environment. I have a sense of control. My mind and body are stimulated. Um, I'm experiencing pleasure. My reality is understood. I'm competent. I'm seen as worthwhile and I feel worthwhile and I'm held in esteem by others. I feel safe, secured attachment and a sense of purpose. And these aren't all of our emotional needs, but they're an example. And I'm not saying that we have to get all of our needs met all the time. But these are, we're feeling more of these emotional needs and our physical needs are feeling okay. Or, or and if we do, and, and when, when you're in this, this cool system or the ventral vagal, you still feel, you can feel sadness, you can feel anger, you can feel anxiety, but it's, you're learning from them. They're not, they're not having to get really big to let you know something bad is happening. And so you can sit with your emotions and listen to them. So for example, you might get, anxiety about a test that you have to take, or you're anxious about getting on that snowboard for the first time, but that anxiety is healthy anxiety to say, hey, there's a little bit of risk here. There's something, or if you fail that test, you're, gonna, you're getting kicked out of school, so you need to actually get some motivation to do something. So it kind of lights the fire, right? Um, so, so over here, beyond our threshold, is where we start to experience um, what I call you know, micro traumas or um, a trauma, we have an intensity, a duration, and a frequency. And so I call a, a lot of clients that come into my office experience a lot of low intensity, high frequency traumas. So things are happening in their environment where their needs are not getting met in a way um, that's healthy for them. Like I think about, I went to public school my whole life and and public school is just full of low intensity, high frequency experiences. Like, um, I won't get into my experiences, with that. <laughs> but, uh, but our work environments, like we're told to sit in your desk and slave away 
And so we're not experiencing pleasure. We're not experiencing any kind of power or influence in our work environments. And so we experience a lot of low intensity and high frequency traumas. And then we get farther down here and there's high intensity trauma. And the hardest one is high intensity frequent trauma. So you're looking at more like complex PTSD down here when you're experiencing a, a lot of traumas and it, you can experience a lot of low intensity traumas happening at, at high frequencies too and that can create complex PTSD. But if you think about it, a trauma happens and your body responds to it. And so, you, so you go into fight flight. So you think about, you scan your environment for safety and when you're in um, the cool system, but you're scanning your environment for how am I unsafe right here? And so you're more in that, um, that um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, it'll come to me in a minute, but, but you're, on, you're on high alert. And so I can go into a lot more, but I'm, I'm mindful of time. Um, Casey, did you want to say anything about this? Yeah, you know, I, I guess the thing that I was going to say is the word I think you're thinking of, um, I'm good with the game taboo, is probably hypervigilance. Thank you. So this constant scanning of this environment and looking for all of the different threats. And I actually love that you went to this slide because this is a slide I was hoping you were going to go to because it answers one of our questions. So I'm going to read this question of, you know, we lost a good friend in an avalanche. My kids are adventurous and love to skin and backcountry ski. And they have level one education and they're fairly cautious, but I'm having trouble letting them go without fear. Any advice for me? And this is what it reminds me of is this idea that when we're scanning for threat, we're going to find threat. Mm -hmm. And when we're uncertain and we're unsure, or we just had a high intensity event like you're talking about, that risk is going to feel so much more prominent. I'm even thinking about, you know, new moms mm -hmm. that are at high intensity, a high level, that they're constantly scanning the environment. You know, if WebMD got paid by every click that a new mom made or a Google search. So there's this piece that at that point in time, sure, some risks are real, but are we also scanning for them because of our own emotional state? Mm -hmm. And also, if what we're trying to do is protect ourselves and protect our community and protect our loved ones, is that ever going to be a reality? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for everyone on this conversation, like I said, this is going to be a series. We're going to be continuing. We're going to be doing a deep dive on survivor guilt. Um, you know, Jenny and I have a few other topics we're thinking about, but, you know, I think something that's interesting with trauma, and then Jenny, I'll let you do a, a close, but is how fragile life is, is really something that people walk around ignoring until it gets shoved in our face because of a trauma. And then we get back to the place where we get back in cars and we get back on the road or we, we go to work and we do this, but it's hard to know that the potential of losing someone is there and it's anxiety producing. And there, so when that question says, do you have any advice for me? I do, you know, not really, because there's nothing I can tell that person that's going to say that their kiddos are going to be safe or not safe. But I know you're probably looking at it more because of this happening in our community. Absolutely. And I think that's a big piece. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I wish we could create that safety, but the reality is that we can't, right? And, and yeah. yeah so, sense. yeah. So one thing, I, I know that we're, we've got to wrap up here, but I, I really want to highlight behaviors. Yeah, because please. Our, our culture, again, we shame behaviors. Um, and so... So we have, you know, we have these experiences happen in our environment and our, our emotional and physical needs are not getting met in these, in these traumas. And so then, just like if you touch a hot stove, you have a behavior to move your hand away from the hot stove. Or you break your, your, your wrist and we have pain receptors that go to the wrist. And then we have our brain 
creates numbing agents to try to numb the pain. Or we have anger that happens when somebody touches your wrist and you're like, ah, stop. And so just like we have physical reactions to our physical body, our emotions do the exact same thing. And so, so we have two, two different types of behaviors. And so we have sympathetic or mobilized behaviors like anger, aggression, self-criticism, defensiveness, um, rage, well, and you know, overthinking. And so these behaviors come up to say, hey, I'm trying to help you get some needs met so that this doesn't happen again, up in this, this trauma doesn't happen again. And so rather than looking at these behaviors um, as a bad thing, to instead to say, how can these be red flags to help me recognize what needs are not getting met to where I can look in my lifestyle or look at what's happening in my life and to, to have more curiosity around what's happening for me. And so, so I, I think about the mom whose kids are going out, you know, they've got their Avi ones and, you know, they're, they've got a lot of information. And so to think about what needs are not getting met for you, knowing, like thinking about your kids being out there, like how can you find ways to get your needs met to say, you know what, I trust my kids' decisions or yeah, there's a risk here. And how can I recognize that I don't have full control? And so um, and I know we're at the end of time, I wanna honor the dorsal vagal or the freezing emotion or behaviors too. And, um, and so dissociation, um, out of body experiences, fogging out, distraction, drinking, you know, cutting, these are all trying to move you away from the pain that's happening around these traumas. So I, I guess the takeaway here is don't look at these behaviors as evil, awful, bad things. Um, they're trying to get your attention. And the more you don't listen to them, the bigger they get. So, so there's that. <laughs> um, Absolutely. I love that. And I really love this concept of how you can look at your emotions as communicating something to you and something that you might need. And I think it, it's interesting, you know, we had the example in the question of somebody who's very worried about their kids for a very related activity. But I think what I've seen come up in our community too is, you know, many of you on this call might be experiencing anxiety that's not so directly related. I had someone I spoke with, you know, um, after one of the avalanches and it said, you know, I'm just really nervous about putting my kid in the car seat and making sure it's buckled correctly. And that's the interesting thing about trauma is it really becomes, and Jenny and I'll probably talk about this at our next talk, so, but it becomes this whack-a-mole as it can pop up in so many different ways. So this anger, this aggression that you're talking about, or this freezing or this feeling stuck, sometimes you know it's related and sometimes it feels so different mm -hmm. and it's not. It's Absolutely. the exact same. Absolutely. Yeah. So... so here we <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Jenny. I was going to ask you if you had any thing, last words you wanted to end on. Well, I, I appreciate all of you, your curiosity and your openness to, to come to this presentation, or if you're watching it later, to, because this is important. And so thank you for being here. And, and like Casey said, I mean, there's so many more slides that we can go through and we'll just, we'll create more presentations and please let us know what you're interested in and what you want to know about. Um, and Casey, I'll hand it over to you for any last minute thoughts or resources. Yeah, Jenny, do you mind us uh, going to the very last slide, the Olivia's Fun slide? I always like putting a plug in for this one. Yeah. Yeah, keep your eyes shut, guys, because this is our content for our part two, so. <laughs> I'm more really excited for some of those. <laughs> there that, we go. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah. So just a reminder, you know, I think one question I get to my personal email a lot is how do we know when to seek help? Or how do I know when to encourage my husband to seek help or my boyfriend or my sister? And the fact is that behavioral health works best if we're not treating it like an emergency room. If we can get ahead of things and we don't wait till things are so bad, we can't ignore them. And so I think it's always so important to think about Olivia's Fund. 
Um, this is a behavioral health scholarship program, six free behavioral health sessions for anyone who lives and works in Eagle River Valley and identifies a financial barrier. And really it can be any financial barrier at all. You can go to eaglevalleybh.org backslash Olivia's Fund and complete the application, which is very quick and easy and hopefully painless. It's available in English and Spanish. We have over 70 providers at this point, and you know, Jenny, our presenter today, is one of them. And so we're gonna be bringing her back on a community level, but please know that support is out there. And you know, we have had a very intense year as a community, even if we don't think about COVID. We have had a tremendous amount of loss. We've had a tremendous amount of trauma. And I think it's important to recognize that all of us are in pain and we can, um, we can support each other and this can be part of it. And so we look forward to continuing to support everyone through these presentations. And please email Eagle Valley Behavioral Health anything that you really loved in this presentation you guys would like us to expand on and we'll continue this piece. And for the individuals that talked about their kiddos, you know, we're also talking about designing a similar presentation for the youth. So we look forward to it. And Jenny, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much for asking me. It's a huge honor to be here. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.